Bene, buonasera, benvenuti. Good evening. We have this opportunity to reflect on a crucial topic in this period in the world, emergencies in the world of the role of international organizations. Uh, we probably have to update our knowledge on this word, uh, emergencies. We have the impression that emergencies have become the normal situations uh, in our current uh, um, conditions. We live uh, in a constant emergency uh, if we think about the um, latest events, uh, conflicts, uh, violence, uh, terrorism, migrants, uh, refugee, refugees, uh, an entire nation of about 70 million people in the world is today considered as a, a population of refugees, as if it were a, uh, a country larger than Italy, dispersed uh, around the world looking for a home. Uh, we live as we uh, felt uh, assaulted, uh, attacked, uh, or surrounded by emergencies. On the one hand, we may feel powerless in facing with these emergencies, and on the other hand, we wonder, um, we question the role of the international organizations uh, that were established uh, at the end of the terrible experience uh, uh, of the second, uh, First and Second World Wars. Uh, uh, so we wonder why are we not able to face this emergency? Why are these international organizations uh, seemingly um, inadequate to face these uh, situations? How should we approach the topic of refugees uh, and migrants? Uh, how should we uh, face and deal with conflicts? Uh, uh, for instance, the conflict currently um, being waged in Syria, uh, not to talk about the problems in Libya. In many cases, we feel that the organizations at international level, uh, the European Union, the UN, um, are uh, incapable of uh, uh, tackling these issues. This is why in uh, this year's meeting, uh, focusing and following uh, our interest in these uh, topical issues, we decided to um, hold such a session. The international organizations are the key interlocutor in such complex situations in order to be able to uh, discuss the ones with the others and at least try and tackle uh, the greatest problems we are confronted with. This is why we have uh, a some friends, a panel of experts. First of all, they are friends of the meeting, starting with uh, Monsignor Tomasi. Uh, he's a nunc in uh, Geneva, and he knows the meeting very well. Many of us know him uh, quite well because he's one of the uh, dearest friends of our um, uh, meeting, and he always comes, uh, he comes every year, um, because we, uh, we like to invite him every year to come to the meeting. Then we also have with us Mr. Pasquale Valentini, the Secretary of State for the Foreign Affairs and Political Affairs of the Republic of San Marino. And he will talk about the experience of a very small state as, um, as noble and as prestigious uh, as, it, as it may be. Uh, yesterday, uh, the First Lady of Afghanistan spent the evening at the um, the afternoon and the evening in San Marino. We know that with just a, a few resources, it, it is also possible to do a lot. And so uh, small, little realities, little states such as the Holy See, uh, the Vatican, and another very small state as San Marino uh, may, in any case, provide a great contribution. And then uh, Mr. Paolo Carozza, the director of the Helen Kellogg Institute for International Studies uh, at the University of Notre Dame in the US, in Louisiana. And 
Last but not least, Mr. Giampaolo Silvestri, the Secretary General of the AFSI Foundation. Uh, so, uh, before leaving the floor to them, I will introduce them briefly, but I would like to ask Monsignor Tomasi to help us uh, uh, set the framework for this situation, because I know he's got some very interesting um, thoughts, uh, interesting remarks to make. Uh, the title of this session stemmed from our conversations. We asked him some suggestions uh, for possible topics uh, to be uh, dealt with uh, during this meeting, and we also wanted to find a, um, a topic uh, which he could like. I will not dwell on his biography, otherwise I would dwell too much and we wouldn't have time to talk about this uh, topic. But Mons Monsignor Tomasi is uh, an ambassador of the Holy See in um, Geneva at, you know, at International Organizations of Geneva. Geneva is one of the most international, uh, the most cosmopolitan uh, towns in the world because it um, hosts a lot of international organizations, 9,000 meetings at um, diplomatic level every year um, in Geneva. So just think uh, about the importance of the work and the amount, extent of the work of a small entity such as the Vatican vis-à-vis um, -vis the number of uh, officials uh, uh, who um, belong to other um, larger states. Uh, you know that in Geneva, uh, Geneva uh, hosts uh, the World Health Organization, the ILO, uh, and, um, and all then the staff of Monsignor Tomasi uh, is uh, limited uh, uh, in its number, but uh, they are um, always uh, willing to work hard. Uh, to uh, come to terms with all these meetings. Thank you very much, Roberto. I will try and uh, to be uh, up to the task you've given me to provide a framework for the international uh, situation and the role of the international organizations. In 1945, the Second World War uh, ended with its horrors. The uh, United Nations were created, were established uh, 70 years ago, a world st uh, structure with many specialized agencies on um, labor, health, uh, refugees, etc. Uh, it was a vital necessity to uh, support and consolidate the order at international level, the human rights, the economic stability, prosperity, and the prevention of tragedies such as the uh, recently ended uh, Second World War and Holocaust. After the um, First World War, in 1919, the Society of the Nations had been established with similar objectives, yet the prevailing of national vested interested interests and the incapability of um, many states to come to terms with the situations of emergencies led to its end. Now the crises are widespread and they are overlapping. There are um, lots of uh, dangers for war in Ukraine, in other states. We have ethnic conflicts in Africa. We have massive uh, uh, episodes of exodus of uh, entire populations. And for instance, the Mediterranean Sea has become a cemetery. Um, of asylum seekers who drown um, hoping to uh, come to Europe. We may ask ourselves, we may wonder whether the international organizations are really up to their institutional target goals and whether they are uh, capable to manage the situations at world level. Violence continues to uh, claim lives, the lives of people we may think that a cycle of history is closing. The UN, since 1945, has changed, but the world has changed even more. Therefore, there's a need for a third generation of multilateral institutions after the Society of Nations and after the UN able to manage the global problems such as global warming, terrorism, the proliferation of nuclear weapons uh, which uh, cannot be uh, dealt with unilaterally by the individual states. As Kofi Annan said, these problems have no passports. 
so um, the um, block, but blocking the effectiveness of the action of the UN and the other international organizations uh, and the incapability to finding an exit, a, a gateway uh, for international crisis uh, leads to the fact that the national uh, sovereignty has uh, carried out several attempts to act for the common good, but it was incapable to adjust uh, its scope and its actions to the changing situation. The states are becoming more and more connected, the ones with the other, and they are also more and more interdependent. So an impartial interpretation of the activities of the UN shows that this is the best mechanism created so far to deal with problems uh, which the traditional system of states uh, cannot uh, tackle. It's a forum, an arena for meetings, and the UN offers the possibility to negotiate and prevent conflicts, uh, coordinate uh, the assistance in case of emergencies, uh, supporting and um, legitimizing the uh, process of independence in colonial states, uh, disarmament, and the development of poor states. An example of how the UN uh, tried to respond to the needs of the international community is its approach to human rights. So we moved from the Committee for Human Rights, established in 1948, to the Council uh, for Human Rights. That was a leap forward because in the, in the new system, the Universal Protection Review was adopted. Each state is examined in terms of its application of human rights. And this forces the states to at least think twice uh, about the way they are behaving when it comes to the uh, respect and enforcement of human rights. Yet, the perception of uh, ineffectiveness uh, and inconsistency with the principles of the Charter of the United Nations uh, um, is emphasized by the development of the world governance. We have come to a situation in which we have three United Nations, three groups of uh, stakeholders in the global governance. The set of uh, uh, procedures, institutions, uh, laws, uh, um, making up the relations uh, uh, between citizens uh, uh, and the states is the governance. In this context, uh, um, states carry out their activities, for instance, uh, officials uh, um, working in the uh, facilities in the uh, agencies of the UN this is a new aspect of multiculturalism, namely the fact that we have new strengths, uh, new powers uh, um, grouping together to do what the international organizations should do. So we have uh, a blurred outline, a blurred landscape uh, in which there's a mixture of vested interests, a lack of view, uh, duplication of services and artificial groupings. Um, the result is a very slow, uh, if not paralyzed, uh, action. Over many years, uh, since the uh, world governance has been uh, discussed, several proposals were made, a realistic reform so that the existing system can work, a federal kind of reform on, according to the model of the European Union, and finally, a proposal to create a global state. In the last 10 years, the geopolitical and economic paradigm that led to consolidate the divisions between the north and the south of the world has been largely overcome. As the Human Development Report of 2013 concludes, the principles that motivated the institutions after the Second World War and the policymakers need to be um, uh, gauged again. In this sense, the attempt to uh, unblock the status quo uh, led 
the uh, in breaks uh, the breaks countries uh, brazil uh, russia india um, China and South Africa to state their autonomy with the creation of the new Bank uh, of Development. Therefore, we have a new phenomenon which is taking place, responding to the slow actions of the existing institutions. We are witnessing the birth of the Global Economic Forum, the New World Bank, uh, the Bank for Development, uh, and we are witnessing new political alliances as the G20 group, etc. Uh, These new agreements are the expression of uh, alliances aimed at preserving the powers uh, of those who uh, already have the power. And they may lead to reactions. In addition, private initiatives often show to be more effective. For instance, the decisions taken by the World Economic Forum, for instance, uh, managed to mobilize the leaders and to provide ideas uh, which the United Nations cannot do. The social doctrine of the church offers a uh, response in terms of principles and it um, backs up a world authority, starting from an ethical foundation leading to uh, an inclusive view, a universal view. And this um, dates back to the um, ages, to the years of uh, Pope um, John the Twenty-Third. He said that there are problems that cannot be solved by an individual state and therefore they go beyond the ability of a state to solve them. So for the common good, it is necessary to find a global authority uh, that can manage to provide adequate answers to the needs of the people. The principle of subsidiarity uh, can be the driving force and so this authority could tackle these issues, the issues that the state nation cannot solve. Uh, while the UN is currently not able to do it, the World Authority would have the capability, the political capability, of uh, forcing the uh, application, enforcement of rights. The uh, Vatican Council with the um, Guardium and Spes um, Constitution um, repeats uh, several um, topics of the um, other encyclical letters by uh, Paul VI, for instance, there is a whole uh, thread in the social doctrine of the church supporting the need for a global authority. I'm not talking about a global state, I'm talking about an, a global authority having an effective power to intervene and to decide. In 2009, the encyclical letter of uh, Pope Benedict XVI, uh, Caritas in Veritate, opts for a comprehensive view in a society moving towards globalization, as the Pope said, the common good and the commitment for the common good cannot but be um, an issue for the entire family of the world, for the entire mankind so that we can provide peace and unity to the town, to the city of man, and make it an anticipation of the um, city without boundaries of God. So the need to provide uh, a response to the needs for globalization from the point of view of uh, universal solidarity, namely international solidarity, solidarity between the peoples, aiming to reach a real um, planetary development. Looking at the future, what may we expect? The foundations on which we can build um, international institutions for the future cannot be um, but solid. The current situation led to the creation of a constellation of entities which together carry out a global governance and it helps us understand what's happening, but 
it does not help us uh, um, reach an agreement on what should happen in the future without entering into details with specific, specific proposals. The social doctrine of the church proposes a real authority able to decide and therefore solve the global problems. The transnational social forces are moving towards this direction, uh, transcending the uh, system that emerged from the Westphalia Treaty. The ethical basis uh, underlying the uh, United Nations Charter and the, the Universal Declaration of the uh, Rights of Man remains valid. The counterculture of the 60s, uh, symbolized by Woodstock, introduced a different interpretation of the words used in these documents. Uh, uh, words which are redefined in the framework of uh, uh, an exceeding excessive individualism. And this reminds me of one of the sentences by Roberto. Woodstock is killing the UN and now the UN needs to be uh, rebuilt. For instance, the word sex is uh, replaced with the word gender. Discrimination is replaced by distinction. Family by families, and we are lacking some words. Um, marriage, faith, love, religion are words that are no longer used. In the text of the objectives for sustainable development after 2015, the dignity of the person is not uh, linked to the nature, but linked to social equality, economic well-being, and it must be conquered with their own strengths. Programs and political strategies, regardless, therefore, of any reference to transcendence. Substantially, we are faced with two different uh, philosophies, uh, opposing philosophy and opposing anthropologies. The one starts from the realism of the being as such, and the other starts from an ideological definition which is a subjective definition of things. In this mentality, in this way of thinking, the courts tend to um, um, tend not to know that uh, there are uh, acts which are intrinsic evil, uh, bad acts. But Pope Francis, uh, in the recent encyclical letter La uh, observes that the uh, deviated uh, anthropocentrism leads to a deviated, uh, distorted uh, uh, lifestyle. The uh, pragmatism marks our uh, age, and it is even more dangerous than the doctrinal one. When the human beings uh, place themselves at the center, they give absolute priority to immediate convenience, and all else becomes relative. Hence, we should not be surprised to find, in conjunction with the omnipresent uh, technocratic paradigm and the cult of unlimited human power, the rise of a relativism which sees everything as irrelevant unless it serves one's own immediate interests. In this context, it is fundamental to develop stronger international organizations that are better organized as authorities appointed impartially thanks to agreements between the various states and uh, um, with a power to enforce sanctions. It will not be possible to uh, develop uh, global regulatory frameworks uh, imposing uh, obligations or in, uh, unacceptable, unacceptable um, actions. Uh, as we are seeing now, the cruelty of the so-called Islamic State without going beyond national interests and without uh, replacing the current uh, individualism with a real uh, globalization of solidarity. To conclude, the multiplication of the facilities and the effectiveness of institutions will never lead to an integral development. It will be the creativity of the persons, of the individuals, seen as the focal point of every action. And we also need to provide them the necessary uh, spaces in order to fulfill themselves. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Well, as I hoped, 
you helped us uh, not only to understand and to learn a little bit more about the international context, but you also provided us with a new, with an innovative uh, interpretation of what's happening and what we are witnessing uh, right now. You know that there is uh, a historical kind of relation between the meeting of Rimini and the Republic of San Marino, and this is uh, um, embodied by Mr. Pasquale Valentini, who's, who since the 2012 has been the Secretary of, of State for uh, Foreign Affairs and Political Affairs of the Republic of San Marino. He has a long biography of commitment in the social and political fields in the non-profit organizations but today he's here in his uh, quality, in his function as Minister of San Marino, um, taking part in the life, everyday life of these international organizations. And we are here to listen to his point of view. Thank you. Well, I take for granted all the beautiful words that you've mentioned, but really exaggerating. Well, the would like to thank you all for the opportunity of being here. And it was interesting to listen to uh, His Excellency Monsignor Tomasi for the framework that he depicted. And I uh, would like to say something about the role of a very small state, uh, as, such as San Marino, as we are part of the, the whole system that we're talking about. First, I would like to um, make some observations uh, about the general framework on how the current situation could be uh, dealt with. We are facing very serious uh, emergencies at a global level. We know that there is a multilateral setting within which nations can have a dialogue and find solutions that, uh, as uh, Monsignor Tomasi said before, must be necessarily global and going beyond the powers of single states, individual states. So the existence of such a setting is really important, very important. John Paul II uh, in 1995 uh, uh, was at the UN and talked about this setting as a moral center in which all the nations of the world feel at home. It was a sort of family of nations, that definition provided by the Pope at that time of the uh, United Nations. Thirty-two thousand people live in uh, 60 uh, square kilometers, so it's a really small place. We don't have oil, we don't have diamonds in terms of natural resources. So, you know, being part of a setting like this, it's a big responsibility, but it's also a guarantee because uh, before any attempt uh, of prevailing on the part of other subjects, we know that we can be part of a family. And over the last few years, uh, however, the experience taught us that we really need a rethinking of that. Uh, organization because we've experienced some weaknesses uh, in terms of uh, prompt actions uh, of the, this organization before emergencies. So the issue of uh, reforming the United Nations and all the other connected institutions uh, is really topical. That was in the agenda when I took office, but uh, I know that this issue has been uh, uh, in the agenda for many, many years. And I know that it's something that uh, is also discussed at the General Assembly of the United Nations. So what is the direction that we could adopt to uh, think about this uh, rethinking, the reorganization of uh, this setting? First of all, I think that uh, a reference could be used, and that is uh, the respect for human rights. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights is certainly the basis of uh, dialogue among nations. To have a dialogue, it is necessary to get to the root of dialogue, that is, to consider something that all the nations can consider as universal. 
this respect, uh, there are a couple of big limits. The first one was uh, mentioned, well, both were mentioned by Monsignor Tomasi, actually. One of these is the fact that we are uh, facing a shift in uh, uh, the rule of law and rights. The universal character of rights that uh, is at the basis of the declaration itself, is being replaced by an individualistic view of rights. So this is a big change in its nature, and that what which was uh, to be the promotion of uh, freedom in all its manifestations, especially in its uh, family and uh, uh, local contextual nature, these elements uh, are deleted by doc in, in the documents. So, uh, the legal systems and the laws are being changed in this way and uh, uh, it's necessary then to think about this route again because we are deleting uh, certain areas and we will see specific uh, individualistic interests prevail. There is a gap between the general indications that the UN can give and the decisions uh, adopted by individual states. There is a nice example of the Council on Human Rights, but uh, today uh, there's no uh, tools available so that what is uh, adopted and acknowledged at a universal level is also uh, included uh, at local level straight away. In addition to this, there's also a different world. The world scenario is really different, and so the organization of, of these bodies do not really mirror what's going on uh, out there. For example, uh, African states really uh, are not involved in uh, decision-making uh, bodies, and so we need really to change this. And then in seeking solutions to all these problems, one may lose sight of the fact that uh, it should be necessary to uh, start off working uh, with a dialogue uh, in context where this dialogue exists already. There are indeed uh, experiences and examples where uh, what is expressed as an ideal is also put into practice. The subsidiarity principle, for example, well, instead of thinking and imagining solutions to problem, well, the first thing to do maybe would be to emphasize and support those uh, uh, situations, those experiences, which are already implementing effective solutions. Today, for example, we have uh, listened to the uh, First Lady of Afghanistan, Yesterday I talked to her and uh, she is uh, asking for support for the action, to the action that they are engaging because that's what they need to carry on with their um, works and activities in rebuilding that country. And the last point I would like to make is this. I think that the crisis of international organizations really uh, mirror uh, the crisis that's uh, present now in the political world. So, sort of final warning here, because uh, there is a kind of a general effort so that uh, politics uh, is uh, really experienced in a different way and to represent institutions and represent uh, other subjects uh, that are up to the target, up to the tasks that we uh, need to uh, fulfill. That's what I sometimes have to face and uh, I have uh, uh, strong um, views on this, uh, that sometimes we try and face issues with an approach that is not adequate and uh, basically the objective uh, should be the promotion of uh, the human being and uh, not uh, other things. Thank you. Davanti a
there's a really a lot of complexity. So what can I do? We are little parts in a big machine, the history, the big machine of history. So we feel overwhelmed by um, these uh, big issues and by uh, these uh, situations of standstill and crisis. So uh, here it might be interesting to learn more about uh, the experience of a civil society that is uh, subjects that work for a true social expression and these subjects really collaborate and uh, live within this system because they also uh, go and work where emergencies uh, take place. Uh, we have uh, ABSI here with uh, Gian Paolo Silvestri, who is Secretary General of the ABSI Foundation since July 2013. ABSI is a non-governmental organization in more than 13 countries in the world with different projects in different fields. And they also work uh, a lot in uh, uh, different sectors uh, where emergencies are present. Last April, Gian Paolo Silvestri was uh, appointed by the Ministry of of Foreign Affairs, a member for de co co developmental cooperation uh, uh, on the part of uh, co organizations in the civil society. So it will be a pleasure to listen to your remarks on this uh, issue of the crisis of international organizations. Thank you very much and good evening. Clearly, um, I'll try to give you a number of examples based uh, on our experience in the field. Where uh, our uh, activities are fulfilled uh, with, together with uh, international organizations in the emergency situations. So I will try to refer to all the problems and the critical situations that were mentioned by Monsignor Tomasi, which really have an impact on uh, everyday uh, life and uh, situations. Uh, I would really like to talk about more of a crisis rather than emergencies, because there are many situations in the world where problems have been long lasting. For example, the Syria situation or the situation in Iraq, that's not really an emergency because more than five years have gone by now. So that's really a crisis, not an emergency. Um, we are involved in the crisis in Syria and in Iraq with uh, asylum seekers there, with refugee people, and there's displaced people in Syria as well and then displaced people in Iraq. We are also involved in the crisis of uh, the southern part of Sudan, which is not really mentioned by anybody, but there's a civil war there that has been going on uh, for years. And in Adab, where there's the biggest uh, refugee camp uh, of the world, uh, there's a 400,000 refugees from Somalia. And that camp has been there since 1992, so it ha it's uh, more than 20 years old. And then there's the Repu Democratic Republic of Congo, where there's millions of internal displaced people with uh, different conflicts, uh, with uh, um, problems that are not even mentioned by the media. And then in Sierra Leone, with the Ebola problem, which is still there, unfortunately, and Sierra Leone uh, has not uh, been healed. Well, what happens to these people when an emergency occurs? These people lose everything. Emergencies are mostly due to security problems uh, or economic crisis. Well, they lose everything. Until not long ago, on the one hand, we were used to this kind of crisis in Africa and maybe superficially, we might have said, well, these people didn't really have a lot. So if they displace themselves, they don't really lose a lot. However, today, uh, these crises really take place in contexts that are really similar to our context, where people have a normal life standard. I think of Syria and Iraq. Well, these people, all of a sudden, they lose everything. That's what you have to try and think about. You are at home, 
with your quality of life, you have a Wi-Fi connection, your fridge, your equipment, and then all of a sudden you have nothing. Think about it. Nothing. You just have the clothes you're wearing. Sometimes it's really necessary to imagine something like this, to understand this kind of situation. That's what happened to uh, Iraqi refugees. Mosul had kind of standard as in Rimini, not really like Rimini, but uh, that was a really high standard of life and then all of a sudden nothing. Well, you can appreciate how serious the situation might become this way. These people lost everything and above all, well, they lost everything in terms of uh, assets and food and support. So what they really need, they need uh, to be accompanied, that they need uh, support, they don't have to be abandoned, that's what they ask, they ask not to be abandoned, they ask not to be left alone, they need uh, uh, some support, that's what we try to do, that is promoting the dignity of persons with actions that are limited, we can't really solve every problem, but with small actions, we can really show that they are not alone, and so we can give examples in this way. Whenever an emergency occurs and we consider that we should take action there because we might be already present or maybe there's someone asking for help, we launch a fundraising campaign. This is extremely important, not just because um, financial reasons, that's for sure, because without money it's impossible to take any action, but uh, the reason is that behind us there is uh, there's peoples. We have launched many campaigns here at the meeting in Rimini and we always had a wonderful response, a positive response of many people supporting. And he, this shows that there's uh, people doing something. They, they do what they can do, but they use the solidarity, they show solidarity, and we try to express this to the people we help. We want them to understand that in the help that we provide, there is a number of people doing something. And when we communicate this, people appreciate it, they can see that, they understand. It's not just the fact of providing them with blankets or food packages or sending their children to school, they really understand that this is the result of a long work carried out by people, by a lot of people, for example, here in Italy, there's a lot of people working, doing something for them because they don't want them to be left alone. That's a kind of rebirth of a new conscience. I would like to show you a very short video, five minutes, which shows what we do in the field in collaboration with international organizations. It's really five minutes uh, uh, about what we do in Lebanon with the UNICEF uh, together with Syrian refugees. فوجئ بأحداث غيرت مجرى There were different events all of a sudden. It, we had to leave our countries, we leave, uh, to leave our homes and to go to Lebanon. We came here to Marjeko camp where my husband found a job and where my relatives lived and the members of our family. After three years, Abed's family left and uh, they were hit by a tragedy because a relative of their family was killed. This tragedy was uh, affected a family of six people who um, were living there and uh, really all the members of the family were affected by this loss. 
the children, for example, one of them didn't eat for days after that loss. Circumstances didn't allow the children to attend a primary school in their country. However, uh, we, had, we started an educational project with APSI and UNICEF, financed by the European Union, and these children started to attend school to learn reading and writing. What do you wear? A pink t-shirt. Can you say that in English? Hassan was a very aggressive uh, and hyperactive child. He didn't like coming to us and uh, he didn't like coming to school and he didn't like staying with other children. He, always, well, he was always fighting with them. But after a year with the children, working with the children, things started to change. I perceived that things were improving and his behavior was changing for the better. He stopped fighting with his, do with his uh, sister. I like my uh, friends and we play together and we have a lot of fun. They teach us uh, English, Arabic and French. The strength here is uh, a holistic approach that can promote the development of children. This means implementing activities of uh, non-informal organizations uh, in schools, but also other activities of a communi community nature to improve the relations of the children with the family and the community. Remedia courses are offered at school and are open to students with learning difficulties to integrate them into the Lebanese curriculum. There are language and maths courses. Besides these activities, the facilitators can also take care of children who have psychological problems, psychological condition. For example, there is a lot of children who are aggressive and there is a psychologist helping them to improve their uh, situation. We make a lot of efforts to take care of Hazam and uh, our presence really is uh, very important because he showed that he started to change his behavior. Hazan and Ayet, they dream of having a beautiful future. I want to become a teacher, an art teacher, and I want to be a doctor. These children were really happy while singing, dancing, and repeating the letters of the alphabet. So this is just an example of the many activities that we carry out in collaboration with UNICEF. I would like to give you some more examples to make you understand what it means to collaborate with those organizations and what the difficulties are deriving from the approach that Monsignor Tomasi mentioned before. For example, today in Lebanon and in many other countries, there is a way in which uh, organizations operate to introduce refugees and they use prepaid cards. This is obviously possible in countries where there is a banking system and, and a trade system in place, but no, they receive prepaid cards and they can use them to pay uh, for things and to buy things. So this approach has an advantage, which is that it reduces management costs, it's cost effective indeed, but it is really depersonalized. At the end of the day, the uh, refugee is becomes a number. 
we are really against this approach and we really try to make understand our view to uh, international organizations because it's true that it's cost effective but it doesn't help improving dignity because the person is totally dependent on help our alternative is this uh, programs for example uh, that are called cash for work that is men may work men who are in these camps may work there are refugees who have been there for five years these men do nothing and it's really degrading not to do anything for them so involving them in activities in uh, job related activities or social activities really help them recovering their dignity this is really difficult this message is really difficult to get through because it's uh, more expensive the more control is needed but that's the approach we like because we think that in this way the dignity of people can be promoted in a better way in some organizations we manage to uh, establish this dialogue but it's not easy because we have to fight every single day so these organizations are extremely important because uh, sometimes they are the only ones uh, that are able to take action in certain settings but they have a lot of red tape uh, and a lot of other problems because uh, that's the way it is but these organizations are also made of people there are people there that may be uh, impressed they may be fascinated by something interesting that they see that can work to improve people's dignity so these people too manage to appreciate the alternative approaches our experience tells us that uh, in the, these situations of crisis that are now increasing there's a 70 million refugee people today in the world maybe that's the highest number in history well it is now uh, possible to preserve one's identity. To, it's possible to be there, showing a specific identity. It must be clear, it must be uh, visible with facts and alternative actions that are proposed. That's what we try to do. This is the way that is showing a different identity, which in practice is basically uh, loving actions in order to stop nihilism that we are also affected by well these are signs of a different presence of an alternative so it's possible to do something different and to uh, go beyond this lack that also uh, is also mentioned here at the meeting and that the pope also mentioned in his uh, greetings to the meeting the last example i want to mention is this in Lebanon, there is a she guy, a she guy, who has been there for many, many years, and uh, he could also study thanks to our support. And he saw what we do and decided to come to help us. And he helps some uh, Sunni refugee people. Can you imagine how shocking this can be? So there is a Shia who works uh, with the Sunni. And so there is a big clash between these two groups, you know, in the whole of the Middle East. So things like this are the fruit of uh, education, of uh, years of working in a different way and having a different view and proposing different solutions. And these results really show the international organizations that are full of red tape or policies or rules which uh, human rights theories are now being transformed well these actions are really the key uh, factor that's what we are able to do and we are able to do what we do thanks to your contribution as well thank you very much and i now leave the floor to mr paolo carozza he's the director of the kellogg's Kellogg Institute for International Studies at University of uh, Notre Dame, USA. He's a specialist in constitutional uh, comparative law. And he's worked, uh, he worked a lot in uh, an international organization. He was a member of the Inter-American uh, Committee for Human Rights. Uh, so his view is the view of an analyst, of a scholar, 
but of a person as well who uh, worked within this institution. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm the last one, the last speaker, and I'm impressed by the fact that despite the fact that the perspective, the stance may be uh, very different, I'm the only one coming from the university world, I am not a, an Italian mother tongue um, person, but we all share the same uh, opinion on the biases and the values of the international organization. So I will try and close a circle opened by Monsignor Tomasi and then further developed by the other uh, speakers. First of all, I would like to invite you to reflect, as His Excellency did in a, earlier, on the context in which the um, international institutions are, um, we shouldn't take for granted that these phenomena are recent in the history of the world. Up until the 20th century, for instance, no international institutions as we know today existed, so it is useful for us to question why these institutions uh, were created, were established, uh, and with which goal. In critical moments, we is always useful to go back to the past and, uh, and wonder why. We can note the face of a world which is evolving. It is becoming more and more complex, where the number of stakeholders has um, increased exponentially. Therefore, the need for order in this world is no longer in need of uh, uh, an elite uh, and a restricted number of fact fraction, factions. Uh, we are witnessing uh, an increasing interdependence between the nations, the peoples, uh, where actions occurring in one part of the world may easily influence uh, the uh, well-being of people living in the other part of the world. Therefore, there's a fundamental need for coordination in this world. What emerges is the need for international institutions to become able to coordinate a wide audience of different, different uh, stakeholders so that they can all act and cooperate for the common good. For this reason, considering the complexity and the interdependency of the world, we uh, should no longer imagine, and we can no longer imagine, a reality, a world with no international organizations, uh, despite their being recent. To understand the essential character of these institutions, let's think about their role in today's society. We believe they are essential in the exchange of uh, delicate information uh, as for uh, places of discussion in reaching international agreements, in con the control of uh, abuses of power and in the development uh, of new stakeholders, uh, uh, for instance, marginalized communities. These institutions uh, help us uh, engage and start uh, engage dynamics of interests and powers governing the world, and, being, and they are involved in trying to harmonize the interests uh, of uh, the states with the uh, interests of the uh, organization. They intend to transform theoretical uh, values into realistic practices which may have uh, concrete effects and results in, a cha in uh, facing the challenges of today's world. However, we have been creating a system in which each international organization has a specific and limited task and function. No international organization has the power and faculty to respond globally to the needs of the um, human community. There is no such organization. No international organization can have a global, a general approach uh, able to face the entire gamut of the international needs. So. This system of international governance is quite different from the one we expect from the constitutional uh, organization of, a, of an individual country. The state should respond to the general requirements and needs of the uh, country according to a single individual perspective, harmonizing the various interests of the people. On the contrary, in this case, each institutional or international organization 
represents a fragment of the need that we have for coordination and development of the general order of the human family in its, uh, as a whole. This leads us to reflect on the structural weakness of a system which seems lacking a central unit, a sort of a central driving force moving all the rest of the members so that these distinct organizations become a single body. Although the international law acknowledges the legal um, personality of international institutions according to specific roles and capabilities, these organizations as a whole still do not reflect a human community, which is consistent at international level. Well, using a little bit of fantasy, we may make a comparison, uh, making reference to Pinocchio. These institutions seem to represent a, uh, a, ch a child in flesh and blood, but they remain puppets in their fundamental aspects. Exactly as uh, puppets, they tend to be vulnerable to manipulations uh, by the specific vested interests of those controlling them. Exactly like Pinocchio, who was uh, persuaded by the interests of the uh, cat and the fox, the international organizations uh, are often uh, um, persuaded uh, or um, pushed by the vested interests who want to use them for their own good instead of using the institutions as in essential tools to build the well-being of the entire human family. This is also the perception that has emerged during my uh, working experience uh, within international organizations and in particular the time I spent in institutions uh, um, leading, uh, dealing with the uh, defense and safeguard of human rights. Although they were created to provide an answer to specific human requirements and needs that had emerged in a very particular historical period, these institutions um, in, well, very often these uh, rights are manipulated rather than safeguarded. An example is the dichotomy between the intentions of the treaties, safeguarding the right to life in a very broad sense, and on the other hand, the attempt to instrumentalize the interpretation carried out by the international organization so as to force the uh, states of the world to liberalize the laws on abortion. Therefore, the right to life is changing to the obligation to eliminate life. Another example of this kind of manipulation, and His Excellency Monsignor Tomasi knows it very well, it is a very active uh, topic in Geneva today, is a proposal to create a new uh, legal international instrument which uh, um, should safeguard the elderly people by giving them the right to uh, ask for public assistance in committing suicide. Uh, here we are in George Orwell's world. What did Pinocchio need in order to become a real uh, boy in flesh and blood? He needed to become good. So he needed to exercise virtues, his capability to reason, and above all, the willingness to uh, recognize his independence from his father, who had created it. In other words, Pinocchio needed a heart a heart in the uh, broad sense of the term. So in similar terms, therefore, we can ask ourselves the same question when it comes to international organizations. What do they need in order to become more complete in their uh, ability to serve mankind? They need a heart, as Pinocchio did. Intended as the capability to understand the good and the willingness to pursue the good this human good is expressed with a desire of community, development, uh, liberty, justice, uh, in exchange for a clear orientation towards this authentic uh, human needs, 
we often find in international organizations only an intertwining of um, uh, threads pushing the puppet on the on one side or on the other side we should question on the way to create uh, responses fav really favoring the good at global level what is lacking is an international policy an international policy which is able to propose and implement a commitment with, uh, towards the common good of mankind in recent times Lots of attention has been placed to the um, sympathy for the Pope, uh, for the environment and safeguard of the environment. This aspect is very interesting, but I think that even more interesting and underestimated are other points of the encyclical letter, at least this is my opinion. The first one is the uh, fact of reporting a lack of a real global policy able to uh, foster common good. And second, the remark by the Pope according to which uh, the fragmentation uh, of society, the, uh, according to the technocratic paradigm, leads to a reduction of the capability to understand the great challenges of the world uh, as a whole. And bear in mind their human dimension. This is the diagnosis which emerges if you uh, have a cross uh, check, a cross look at the to the work of the international organizations, the absence of a real international policy is also due to multiple factors. The first factor is the fragmentation. I just mentioned there is no individual organization or community with a general view uh, facing the entire gamut of uh, human uh, needs. Each organization has a partial limited view and this leads to the technocratic uh, uh, problem and then the international organizations remain uh, conditional to the states and these states are dramatically uh, fragmented and in many instances uh, host uh, political dysfunctions uh, within themselves. Uh, how many of us can name about 10 or 12 states in which internal policy is uh, uh, in a healthy state? States in which uh, you can be confident uh, that uh, the common good of the people will be safeguarded. I certainly cannot say that the US uh, is the country and I well, as a foreigner, um, can say that this is not the case of Italy as well. These pathologies at the level of internal policy lead to a negative impact at the level of global institutions. So at this point, what is the next step, the next move um, in a seemingly blind alley? Let's try and identify a stance which should not represent a suitable solution. The creation of a new organization with a special state able to have a decision making power vis a vis all the others. So, trying to build a super state which replicates the powers of the state at the global level. For instance, simply expanding the powers of the United Nations would not solve anything. We may create uh, whatever kind of organization and giving it formal authority, but it wouldn't be able to carry out uh, functions to resolve the problems unless it had a social and moral legitimacy. You may build a bigger puppet, but you would end up having a puppet anyway. Therefore, a genuine global policy for the common good with a heart towards a real human needs and the capability to respond to the needs of man needs to be uh, to have a uh, to be the result of a bottom up approach where the concrete practice of solidarity may develop as a virtue and here we may give as an example some of the experiences uh, carried out by AFSI practical experiences by AFSI 
in these cases we can experiment concretely the um, safeguard of dignity, of human dignity. Dignity is not simply a word in those experiences. This new politics policy coming, uh, starting from a bottom-up approach and reaching the self, well, I was impressed by the fact that uh, I saw lots of similarities in, with this situation in the exhibition on, on Abraham. It depends on, the situation depends on subsidiarity, not subsidiarity intended as a dispersion of power and global authorities. We need a subsidiarity which acknowledges that the real global policy able to provide responses uh, to the needs of a global family needs to be the result of practices of local communities where people really can experience their own dignity and their human development where they can know and evaluate the richness uh, and diversity of the uh, human family. And finally, we should also remember that Pinocchio uh, was not able to become a human being with his own strength. He also needed the graces and the magic of the, uh, of the fairy. In the same way, we will never reach a common policy for the human uh, family if we do not acknowledge the transcendent dimension of each human life. As the inauguration session of the meeting yesterday reminded us, by reproposing religions as the contribution to solving the problems and not as causes of the problem, once again, in this case, uh, Pope Francis is uh, determined in his encyclical letter when he states that no technical solution to the problems of the environment is sufficient if it is not backed up by the common recognition that all the creation is a, a gift of God. The philosopher Alice McIntyre, my colleague at the Notre Dame University, said that in today's world we are waiting uh, for a new Saint Benedict. Yet, I wonder, well, probably the problem of globalization is even more um, elemental. We are waiting for a new Abraham, I think. The first who recognized that the self and as a consequence the, the people stems from the recognition of uh, his de dependence on the other even though you do not explicitly acknowledge this original dependence uh, uh, from another, well, this is a source of the feeling of lack which accompanies us each time we uh, work for peace and for human development and each time we look for justice. Thank you. Thank you, Paolo Carozza, for your uh, contribution. I have uh, uh, some minutes before we uh, draw to a close of the session. Uh, I would like to uh, talk a little bit with uh, Monsignor Tomasi. There's a beautiful book by Marian Glendon describing the creation, the birth, and, and the men and women who drafted the Universal Declaration of the Rights of Man. It was a certain human generation soon after the Second World War, so 46, 1947, that, ge that generation. Um, and Signor Tomasi talked about the Woodstock generation, uh, which came after that generation, um, which led uh, to a new culture and a new orientation. So what kind of third generation would you imagine? Uh, the new pace uh, making it possible for international organizations uh, to be efficient, uh, which already exists or may be created, uh, is the kind of facility which is no longer based uh, on the need to respond to the needs of the individual or his aspirations as an individual, but which is based on the person who is open 
to the others and being open to the other towards the others they are also open to God and this makes it possible to create communities and hence it gives the opportunity to create a response which takes into account the common good the good for all this is substantially the message of the social doctrine of the church to reduce it in uh, simple terms it's a message by Jesus Christ when he said that we need to love each other if we lack this ability to love the others we will never be able to build anything which goes beyond my selfishness Thank you very much, Monsignor Tomasi. I would like to thank Mr. Paolo Carozza, Gian Paolo Silvestri, and Pasquale Valentini. We have lots to think about and uh, uh, lots of sessions in the days to come.